My name is Angelica Cutler, I'm from Panuku, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural Panuku Conversation. This evening we are delighted to have an international guest speaker, uh, Mr Jonathan Smales. Jonathan is a UK-based regenerator and developer, and Jonathan is unique, perhaps, in that he works at that magical nexus between human-based design, sustainability, and placemaking, and the pragmatism of commercial realities when it comes to development. I know that's something that Panuku is grappling with, and we're delighted to have Jonathan's knowledge with us here in the next couple of days. So this evening we have um, an address from Jonathan, then we have a panel discussion, and I'd like to welcome our panellists here this evening. We have um, Chris Aitken from Hobsonville Land Company, another company we know very well at Panuku, welcome. Um, we have Mark Todd from Ockham Residential. We have Kate Healy from Ngāti Whātua Whairawa. And we have Alex Cutler, my name's sake, <laughs> from New Zealand Green Building Council. We'll welcome to all of you. And we will have you come up um, after Jonathan's uh, has given his speech. And that will be an opportunity for the audience to ask questions of the panel as well as Jonathan. Firstly, I'll give you our apologies, or the apologies of my Chief Executive, John Dalzell. He was unable to be here this evening. Um, but in his place, we have an excellent replacement in our Director of Place Shaping. His name is Rod Marler. So Rod leads the team of urban designers and place shapers who, um, as the Panuku vision goes, they are the ones that actually shape the places for Aucklanders to love before the development team get their hands on them to make them a reality. So I'll hand over to Rod now, um, and then uh, we will hear from Jonathan. Thank you. Eke Panuku, Eke Tangaroa. Like the Waka, Panuku Development Auckland requires skill and strength to paddle and keep balance and strong leadership to navigate. Panuku Development Auckland was established as a, a joint venture between uh, Auckland Council Properties and Waterfront <coughs> Auckland in November last year. And tonight I'd like to tell you a little bit about Panuku, what we've achieved down here in Winnie Quarter, and then give you a little more background uh, to our guest speaker, Jonathan, this evening. As I said, we were formed in November last year. We manage underperforming assets on behalf of Auckland Council, and together with joint venture partners, we unlock the full potential of those assets and realise those assets. As the name Panuku suggests, we are about moving forward with skill, strength, and great leadership. We manage about $2 billion of assets on behalf of Aucklanders, and we are proud of the work that we have done down here in Winyu Quarter. The opportunity to open Auckland's waterfront to the public was the most significant urban regeneration that Auckland or perhaps New Zealand has seen outside the Christchurch redevelopment. <coughs> and most of that work uh, was started back in 2010 by C Plus City, then Waterfront Auckland. The stage one opened in August of 2011, and stage two, which we went to the market with in uh, early 2013, is now being realised with projects that are being delivered on the ground right now. Sustainable city building requires leadership and an organisation to take that leadership, an organisation that is prepared to do things differently. And that is why we're here this evening. We believe it is our responsibility to keep our finger on the global pulse of best practice. We look for innovation and we look for ideas that can benefit our city. It is part of our role to act as a leader in that space. As such, we're thrilled to have with us tonight Jonathan Smiles. Jonathan has been a leader in this space in sustainable development for over 30 years. 
He has a proven track record delivering commercial and strategic outcomes in residential and commercial developments. He founded the Earth Centre Charitable Trust, a national millennium project, and between 2000 and 2015 was the executive chairman of Beyond Green, a sustainable consultancy for the built environment, advising on many of UK's biggest and more complex development and regeneration projects, including the Olympics, Earls Court, New East Manchester, and seven major urban extensions of over 50,000 new homes in the UK. More recently, with colleagues, Jonathan has formed Human Nature, a new generation real estate company with plans to fund and master develop a portfolio of sustainable properties in different sites throughout the UK, including an exemplary 1,200 home Riverside mix area in Norwich and 8,000 homes uh, as an urban extension for Hampshire County and Basingstoke councils. He has also spearheaded a philosophy and a suite of principles for Grosvenor's new 21st century urban neighbourhood initiative and a framework plan and place strategy for its first project, the Biscuit Factory and College Sites in Fermanzi. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Smiles. Solar power building in 1999 called the Ark, 
uh, an exhibition center for sustainable industries. That's the planet Earth building. Um, sorry, just to go back. And that was the largest canopy of PVs in Europe in 1998. An organic restaurant there on the right, the first in Yorkshire, probably still the only one. <laughs> uh, and then um, we worked on the uh, Olympics. And I remember at the beginning of that project, the, the minister saying this is going to be a zero carbon Olympics. We were going to name it, don't say it. It's almost literally impossible. And as soon as you hear someone saying that, you know. Uh, that, that you're going to fall short, so let's be more realistic as I have said. But, you know, 9,000 homes being built uh, around the wonderful park that's been created. We did all the public consultation uh, for the Olympics over a five year period. It was brutal, you can imagine. Um, King's Cross, Argent, <coughs> one of the biggest regen projects in the UK, a fantastic project. Excuse me, I just need to get a drink. <coughs> um, and you think of the scale of this, it's the whole piece of city opening up that we didn't even really know was there. Um, again, seven or eight thousand houses uh, done sustainably. We were uh, invited to review the sustainability strategy for it. And actually, because the developers involved, Argent, were so exhausted, really, after 15 years of making a piece of this, it felt cruel, actually, to try to encourage them to do any more. So we kind of invited them to put our recommendations to one side for a few years until they finished the scheme. What we were arguing for was that they'd done as much as they could with the built fabric. And the next frontier was really behaviours, was to get the, the, the businesses there, local residents, uh, to work together on things like cycling, on food, to work in the community, to run education programmes, uh, and so on. And they'll come to that in due course. But what we're seeing in London with this project is a whole area that people, I mean, it had good nightclubs and you know, it's kind of gritty and it's lost some of that, that's for sure. It's a little bit corporate in a sense. But a whole piece of city opening up, connecting through in a way that we haven't seen in, in London for years and years and years. It's a terrific piece of work. Uh, this one uh, is Earl's Court. This is perhaps the richest uh, piece of real estate, new development in the whole of the United Kingdom. This is 70 acres of West London. It's about 14 billion pounds of development. Uh, and we were involved in writing the vision for it and uh, working on the master plan with Terry Farrell and all the policies that attach to it. And the significant thing about this one really was that the CEO, um, uh, at the beginning of the project, when he hired us to work with him, uh, really got what we wanted to do. He really wanted to create an, an exemplary piece of sustainable urbanism at scale and using the wealth that uh, really was behind this project to achieve it. And the interesting, the learning experience from this was that, that he couldn't get his own organisation to go with him on this. And that actually it wasn't to do with plan and design and vision, it was to do with culture, financial model, bringing your investors with you, your stakeholders. And that's what he missed slightly. So as soon as we got down to kind of development manager, project manager level, the financial model, it's not that it's gone wrong because it's hardly started yet. It's just that that initial excitement about the, 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 the possibility of doing something that good at that scale in that part of London just waned a little bit. And then when the urban designers become involved, and I'm not meaning to cast aspersions on anyone in particular in this, uh, but then they have their own model, their own way of doing things, and, and, and can be very strong in those kinds of processes. So we'll see what happens there. It's about 11 stories uh, on average, which I personally think is a little bit too dense for that, because it means that the streets are going to be overshadowed. It'll be a bit sort of canyonesque, potentially. And what it should really have is more gradation and variety uh, in it, and probably. And when we're talking about people, planet, profit here, 
it might make more money for the developer if it was less intense. So we were arguing for intensity, so it's twice as intense as they originally intended. But then they kept winding the handle and it was getting higher and higher and higher and I think it's gone too far. And actually that might affect their value. We'll see, but just, just might. Um, and, and you get a sense of it, and this is probably the greenest bit of the scheme, but it's this uh, theme that we have, which we call abundant green. And it's the notion that in uh, cities around the world, they're going to become more intense. We need to develop compact cities. We need to have more people in less space. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It certainly can be a more sustainable thing. But that doesn't mean to say that it can't be green. We can have greenery everywhere. Green roofs, green walls, green streets, pocket parks, you know, a whole hierarchy of green spaces in an urban place that can um, help to alleviate the, 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 just the hardness of the surfaces apart from anything else, be terrific for urban ecology, grow food, uh, and so on. not because one's aiming to be self-sufficient, but to remind people of where their food comes from, the connection between people in urban places and, and nature. So this was then, um, uh, Terry Farrell talked about five villages at Bellsport, which is a bit rich, really. 11 story buildings aren't often found in uh, French shell towns or English urban villages. However, it sort of got them planning. That was a bit cynical, a bit of a throwaway line. But this was the first village, and we were planning this. And the way that we plan things is engagement, is one of the themes I think for this evening. Is that we call it deep collaboration. So we bring the client at all levels, bear in mind my story about the CEO together with the designers and all the designers, not just the principal and the urban designer or architectural company, but the engineers, all the other architects, the interior designers, the cost consultant, the engineers, and then local stakeholders together. And it's a kind of lock-in for three days. And so we've, been, we've recycled that big <coughs> idea, all the big driving principles and ideas behind the project. And so we've established a consensus around what the priorities are for what this village, in this instance, could be uh, and what it's, how it should be designed. And, and what we get from that is that typically what would happen, uh, what was happening on this project, was there were 30 consultants working on that, 30 different firms. They would all come to a meeting. They'd never met anyone before. The client would come in and there'd be a, a formal agenda. You hardly knew anyone. You had no idea what the, the brief was or the philosophy of the scheme. And you were expected to work together to design one of the most complex pieces of urbanism. Uh, it, it was just, just not feasible. So this is a this deep collaboration is an alternative way of kicking off a project. And if you believe in sustainable urbanism, you have to. I believe you have to do this kind of thing because you have to climb down from the rhetoric, the big you know, the big headlines into the detail of what it might mean. And the only way you can do that is with your colleagues. You can't do it on your own. This one's an interesting one. This was um, an attempt to regenerate Harlow and build a new town for 60,000 people alongside it. And in fact, to regenerate Harlow by building the new town. And that's because um, the people of Harlow so proud of their town, even though it's quite deprived. Now, bear in mind, it's 20 miles from London and 20 miles from Cambridge, and yet it has high unemployment, you know, low economic levels, poor housing. Of course, it's award-winning architecture everywhere, award-winning urban design by Sir Freddie Gibbon. <coughs> and it struggles because of its urban design and because the people who were moved there were typically poorer, disadvantaged people from uh, the east of London after the war, also plonked there in the Essex and Hertfordshire countryside in this very um, suboptimal uh, urban layout. Very idealistic, so you know, idealism is not always a good thing uh, in, in the sense of, you know, the motor car was the great promising exciting technology of that time, so let's design a town around the motor car. Green space is a good thing, so let's have tons of green space everywhere. I remember on this a focus group that we did with people that lived there to understand what they thought was good about the place. And we thought they were all going to say green space and this huge thuggish bloke, kind of worse than me. 
And, and we were chatting to him, he said, do you ever use those green spaces? And he said, no, I never go there, it's really dangerous. <laughs> and it's like a sense that, of course green space, but not everywhere, and not dividing the urbanism up in, in, in the way that it does. So um, the, the BP Pension Fund that owned 1,000 hectares of land next to this, uh, we, we agreed with them that a provider, it was weird being Greenpeace working with the BP Pension Fund, so we had a kind of pact that if we were going to do this, this would be, the ambition would be, it would be the most sustainable new settlement in Europe. And they were like, what do you mean? And I go, I have no idea, but we'll work it out together what that, what that could mean. So it was an amazing kind of three years of R&D in terms of what might make a, a sustainable place. Uh, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it in a moment. This one, I don't know whether you, you recognize this image at all. This was uh, the living cathedral for Christchurch. Uh, and this was commissioned by a, a, a private individual in London, Ewan Harkness, who uh, hails from Christchurch, who's vice chairman of Barclays Bank. When someone who's in that position brings you up and says, would you like to design a cathedral? You go, yes. Um, not, and, and, and we do know a little bit about Christchurch. It wasn't, as it were, just a sort of colonial attempt to superimpose a, uh, a project. But it, it, was, it was a sort of way of... Um, offering an alternative to just carrying on as they were before, a kind of spiritual heart for the regeneration of a traumatized city, with the ambition to be the best small city in the world. So what's the best small city in the world? What might it have at its heart? But a beautiful new kind of sustainable people, a multi-purpose space for events and culture, uh, as well as a, a place of worship at its heart, connecting through to the old cathedral. And this is one that we're, we've been working on as consultants for four years now, and, and now we're pitching to be the development partner. What's interesting, this is potentially 30,000 houses on the edge of Basingstoke. So, you know, just as you've got a, a housing shortage in this, in this country, uh, there's a huge one in the UK. 200,000 houses, new houses, are thought to be needed each year. The population's growing to 70 million within 15 years, and then you've got all the household formation stuff that uh, is happening kind of worldwide. Uh, this is the Hampshire countryside. It's on the edge of another you know, new town, a slightly more successful one, but very car dependent. How do you persuade people who live in a car dependent town that you don't have to have three car parking spaces per plot? And actually, if you do that, it's inimical to being able to create a place that will work well. Well, that's, that's the job that we've had. Now, the local authority here, under a Labour-controlled administration, bought the land 20 years ago. They then lost control of the council that was taken over by a Conservative administration. We didn't want to just build housing estates all over the Hampshire. Entirely understandably, right? It's that they looked at what was happening elsewhere in Britain, so we don't want to do that. So we're not going to bring it forward for development, because we don't want to ruin even more of the Hampshire countryside. So then they were taken to the High Court by the landowner uh, because it was a kind of deal where you know, the, the landowner would get a lot more if it was brought, lost. And then we were brought in to make peace between everyone and develop a vision for something that the administration might like that had a, a good chance of being not just housing estates in the countryside. So we've been doing that for the last few years. And now uh, the exciting thing that's happening there is that very unusual this in the Okay, apart from sort of mega projects like the Olympics where Tony Blair decided he was going to spend nine billion pounds in, in, in the east of London and do 500 compulsory purchase orders in 18 months. So, you know, when the state decides it wants to do something, it kind of can. Uh, it, it can sort of leave a legacy of all sorts of problems when it, when, it, when it does it. But in these kinds of things, it typically doesn't since the Newtown Commission was disbanded. Here, what the, what the local authorities have decided to do is to be the development partner, is to finance the infrastructure, to take, uh, hopefully, the, the profit that arises from it, uh, to have a, a financial partner from the private sector who will share the cost of infrastructure, to create a place brand, and then to sell parcels of land to bespoke developers to a design code. Absolutely, very smart. Uh, and it's not happening nearly enough. It's very, and this is a, a conservative administration, which is very promising and interesting. I think. So 
watch this space on that one. That one could, could, could be very interesting, I think. This is our own development company. And I make no apologies for the image here. We love Copenhagen, right? But for anyone that has been there, you know, it's just what a place. What a place. If you like sustainable cities, if you like people, and if you like tall people with long legs who cycle, this is the, this is the place to, to, to live. It's just, you know, they're, they're kind of getting it right. We'll talk a bit more about Copenhagen in a, in a minute. This is a scheme we did for the University of Cambridge, Northwest Cambridge. This one came second. We thought it was the perfect brief uh, for us. It was all about sustainable lifestyles, um, neighborliness, social architecture, shared spaces. We thought, yeah, we've got one here. And so we competed against all of Britain's biggest developers for a suit of press. We came second. It was absolutely, you know, a bit of us were kind of going, great, we've come second. And then we thought, oh, fuck. We didn't win. <laughs> it was such an English reaction, you know, that you were sort of philosophical and then you start crying quite quickly afterwards. Because <laughs> it's like the best chance in Britain to be to come kind of thing. Anyway, the typologies we developed for this, uh, we're, we're dead proud of. There are kind of sustainable housing typologies. I'll come back to these again. I'm going to run out of time. I keep saying, I'm going to come back to these and it's going to be right over. Um, uh, and, and then uh, we're, we're planning um, uh, urban extensions and building a portfolio of urban extensions. And I think urban extensions, they sound like a bad thing, right? You're building on the green land. But actually, when you try and intensify a suburban condition with all its cul-de-sacs and its lack of co connections and, and a, and a hyper-conservative uh, constituency of local people, Sometimes the best way to do that, I think, to grow time is to put an extension on the end with a different kind of urbanism, with a proper centre and connections, and then gradually work your way back into the town. I think that's, I think that's laudable, but not in every instance, but um, in, in some it can work very well, and that's what we're aiming to do with these. Um, on people, planet, profit, just in case anyone's in any doubt about what I think about it, uh, I just want to say a little bit about... Uh, I'm, Perhaps a bit cynical, right? So when we bought the, the building for Greenpeace, uh, people were like, you know, no, you don't know how to do a building, you can't do a green building, no one knows what that is, it's going to cost too much money. And actually, you know, it was, it was really, really easy. I had a good field in Clegg Bradley, uh, fantastic sustainability architects. It was one of our first big projects. And, and, you know, we've had this in the history of the environmental and sustainability movement that, um, I joined Greenpeace the year after, well, the year the Rainbow Warrior was sunk in this harbour here. And of course the French denied that they were involved, it wasn't them, it was someone else. And, you know, and then it transpired that they were, and it went all the way up to the foreign minister and possibly even Mitterrand. Uh, and then we had governments and industry denying that, you know, the, the, whaling species, the whale species were in trouble because of uh, whaling practices. Uh, or that there's such a thing as overfishing, that like, seems implausible that you can ever overfish the oceans, and yet scientists have been telling us we, for 20 years now that we have. Um, but next, uh, you know, 1987, the Montreal Protocol on CFCs, which is perhaps the single most impactful environmental act internationally that's ever happened, but within a year we got them banned. Uh, and at the time, ICI were on television with us saying that we were going to cause bubonic plague in Europe if CFCs were phased out. I mean, it was just, we had t shirts that said, ICI make holes in the sky. Uh, and Dow Chemical and people like that just denying that there was any relationship to what they did and, and the thinning of the ozone there or that it was a problem. And we've seen it again and again and again. We see it with timber, soil, and palm oil companies. They've got nothing to do with the loss of rainforests, uh, uh, have they? Uh, or, you know, or habitat, or species. <coughs> and, and I think that when we see it with fossil fuel companies in relation to climate change, climate change isn't a real thing. Oh, yes, it is. You know, and, and, and we started our campaign on that in Greece in 1988. Um, so singularly unsuccessful, as it turns out, on that one. <laughs> Um, and even now, you know, some of the major fossil fuel companies are still in denial about, about these issues. And, and I think it's, it's true of urban planners and sprawl, actually. I think that 
I think that the, the theory that even the practice of compact cities for sustainability is well established, and yet we keep building sprawl. Uh, all, and, and in the UK, much more than here. Uh, we're actually being thought of as an expert coming over here. You know, it's sort of humbling. It's extraordinary, really, and embarrassing in a, in a million ways because there's so much rubbish that's done in the United Kingdom, frankly. Um, and, and, you know, cheap, placeless housing that we litter the, 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 the country with is a really expensive thing to do because you'll be, you'll be going back to regenerate it 10 years later with organizations like Panuka having to pick up the pieces with, with significant expenditure to put right what wasn't done well in the first place. And that's just poor economics in the end, isn't it? It's not just unsustainable, it's put people, planet, profit, it's bad economics. Um, so, you know, these companies that could have been adapting and innovating, and governments that could be adapting and innovating, often haven't in the past. They are beginning to now find them. So when people say that sustainable places or buildings or cities or infrastructures are not possible, I refer to that and I think, well, actually, all of these things that weren't seen to be possible or right proved to be uh, true and possible and right. So let's get on and give it a good go, shall we? Let's not be too fearful of the challenge. Um, and let's go on, but let's get down to business and apply some common sense principles to getting this stuff right. So it doesn't seem to be moving. I don't know if it's... I think that the slides are so morally weighty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, so we need to see the world in a, in a new way. And, and we think about, we use the word remarkable. Remarkable lives in remarkable communities, enabled by, lived in remarkable places, enabled by remarkable infrastructures in the context of remarkable cities. Well, and, you know, why not sustainable? Well, because sustainable's lost some of its joy, I think. And actually, in a, in a, in a literal sense, the word sustain, are we actually meaning that we want to sustain what we do now, or just life on Earth? Or do we want it to be better? I think we want it to better, and I think the challenge is such that we need to do remarkable things in the next 30 years at all levels. I think it's a more sort of galvanizing idea, really. And then smart, really? I mean, let's not be thick. Let's be smart, but is it enough? It, it always seems to me that it's kind of technology applied to parking your car in a slightly better way, or telling you where all the traffic is, or you know how to regulate the lighting system on the main, you know, it's not wrong, but it's nowhere near in relation to the kind of scale of challenge or indeed opportunity that sustainable cities and development represents, I think. So what's the, what's the new world we're in? What's the context for all this? I'm actually going to run out of time and I'm like just starting. So how long have I got? That's about four minutes or something. Yeah. 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 Right, I'm really going to race on this now. I'm going to gavel. And it's partly because I'm jet lagged, so I'm speaking in tongues. So let's just see what we can do quickly. These are the 21st century challenges, and they're compounding together in a way with demographic change that we've never seen before. We've never in history seen anything like this. Uh, th those are, that's the range of population, whoops, population projections that we're seeing. So potentially up to uh, 10 billion people, but the significant thing is that 4.8 billion of them are going to be middle class. They're going to be consumers, consumers like you and I, and think how much stuff we consume, uh, and not just fossil fuels, but the whole kind of materiality of the stuff that we use. Think of the carbon impacts of that, the space impacts of that. That's why we need to be remarkable. It's not tidying things up, it's reframing the way we think about stuff. And so, you know, this is New York um, during Hurricane Sandy. Uh, the lights went off, the streets were flooded. Uh, and it's led to Bloomberg then launched um, Plan YC, which is one of the boldest, most exciting city strategies that we've ever seen, uh, I think. And, you know, urbanization worldwide, that we're building a, we need to build a city the size of Greater London every month for the next 40 years around the world to house that additional population. So we better do it right, because you get to regenerate all that again, if you do your retrofit it for low carbon. You know, cycling or walking or walkable neighbourhoods. That's going to be one quite expensive and two probably a bit too late. Um, 
you know, in, in, uh, in China, Beijing, the famous cycling city, um, now is turning into a car city, and of course you can barely breathe. Um, and if they have the same car ownership uh, rates as in the United States, which is where they're headed, there would be another 900 million cars on the road. Um, and and it, it you can't begin to conceive of it. Can you? And yet this is real stuff. These are real projections. Carbon emissions. So if you just look at three countries, China, India, and Nigeria, you look at the population projection for them by the middle of the century, and if they have the same carbon footprint as Americans, and why not? You know, it's a free world. Uh, don't tell Americans how they can live. So why can you tell Nigerians or Chinese or Indians how they can live? So let's all have the same carbon footprint. Problem with that is you've got 48.7 billion tons of carbon going into the atmosphere from those three countries, when actually the global total now is only 31.8. So just three countries by the middle of the century, if, the, if they uh, uh, have the same practice as it was in America, uh, will be exceeding the global total of carbon emissions. It shows you the scale of challenge we've got. This is the cheery bit. This is, that <laughs> <laughs> and this is, this is fun. This is Ebenezer Howard's garden city. So on the left here, how much land that Ebenezer Howard thought you'd need for a self-contained city on the left? If you did an American style, with American plants of consumption and land take, you'd need four times the amount of land. And it's not fiction, is it? It's absolutely what, what happens in Francis. Uh, this, is a, this is in Sweden. It's a real village called Binge, <laughs> um, which seems odd being in Sweden, because they seem quite classical in some ways. And, you know, one of the, the net effects of this is global migration. It's conflict, disturbing societies. Not the only cause of migration, it's a significant one and it will become more significant. And look at the pressure that causes, look at what's happening in England at the moment, look at what's happening across uh, Europe, European borders, the politics of identity, the fear, uh, and it's only just beginning. It's only just beginning. Happy now? Should we go and get a drink? Stop. Um, so what are we, we going to do? Well, look. Uh, there's Churchill again, right? Uh, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. So there's a relationship between the built environment and behaviours. There's a famous professor at Cambridge who denies this. Well, here's a little cameo story, which is that so I have a two and a half year old daughter, I know I look too old for it, but they are. And um, I wouldn't let her cycle, right, or play in our street. She'd be dead within an hour. Um, even my 22-year-old is, you know, sensibly a reasonably sensible young man. I wouldn't, I can't stop him, but I wouldn't really want him, actually. He'd be dead within a week. Uh, in Copenhagen, you know, they let their two-and-a-half-year-olds out onto most of the residential streets. 38% of the journeys in the city centre by bike, 38%. Um, so clearly, urban design and the policies that apply to a city affect behaviour. Uh, and, 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 you know, that affects your health, affects the air pollution, uh, the quality of the, it affects the way you interact with people. So, you know, the image of, that I showed you earlier on of Copenhagen, of all of those people on bicycles, it's a very human, people-oriented way for a city to be. It's lovely, right? Uh, I'm going to jump, I'm going to go through, oh, yeah, so, I reckon... If you're being really purist about it, and why not? If you're trying to redesign your city to be remarkable, you first need to think about what a remarkable life is. What's a remarkable, sustainable life? Uh, and what's a remarkable, sustainable community? When you're clear about what it is that how we can live, the normative side, because of global fair shares, carbon, food, environmental footprint, then we decide as individuals how we want to live. So how shall we? How can we live? How shall we live? When we model that across a, a society, then we know how to design a neighbourhood, an infrastructure, and a city. It's quite an interesting discipline working it through. And actually, now here's the cheery bit. The upside of all of this is that good urban design, good urbanism, is very similar to environmentally sustainable. It's about walkable neighbourhoods, walking, cycling, clean air, 
short blocks, good connections, green spaces, social neighborhoods, urban ecology. You know, that's all good stuff, right? And it's also good urbanism. Uh, and also, when you do it well, it's good economics. People plan a profit. It's an upside to it all. Um, and we need some big, bold gestures that don't become much bigger and bolder. And look at that, right? And think of the, how profitable this stuff is around it. You know, the most profitable, the most expensive real estate in the world, probably, because of the park. And so big gestures uh, that seem extraordinary and kind of ridiculous. You couldn't imagine even thinking about it today. And yeah, you know, they did it and look what happened kind of thing. We need some of those in our cities, uh, I think, as well. Um, yeah, this is about cities. That's a ludicrous picture in some of the places, but a great book for a kind of mental picture. Um, but, you know, he talks about intensity in cities. Is, is a kind of good thing as well. The, the exchange, like we're doing now, you know, it's easy to get together to exchange ideas uh, and start new businesses. Um, it's a creative, uh, cities are creative places, and they're very efficient sustainability vehicles for people, uh, by and large, when done well. Except, when you look closely, there's a lot of science in this, and led by Tsinghua University in China, weirdly. To, to model the carbon impacts of different types of elements. Uh, and this is San Francisco. So in the high density bits of San Francisco, the average carbon footprint is six tons. And then in the sprawly bit, it's 21 tons. And the people aren't different, as it were. It's just that they're great big flat houses with four car, big drives, yeah, all that heating uh, and cooling, because there's no, you know, there's no massing of the buildings. And we have to drive everywhere. So, because the dislocates them from where they work uh, and where they shop and where they take their leisure. Look at the difference in carbon. Again, so the compact connected city becomes the key. Sorry, we've done that, but this is all too much detail, so I'm going to, I'm going to jump to a few other examples at the end. And this is a walkable neighborhood that we designed for Harlow. There are 13 of them, so this is a town for 60,000 people, comprising a series of interconnected walkable neighborhoods. And so it has a high street down the middle, a school at the, the apex of the high street, and the purple is mixed use along the high street, so that you can, the idea is that within a 400 meter walk of where you live, you can meet your everyday needs, um, i.e. you can walk to it. Now it's slightly idealized, and, and actually bringing that off in practice is very difficult to do. Savills were, were, the, were the agents advising on this, and they said, for one of these neighborhoods, we'd be lucky to get a Tesco Metro for the whole thing. Then you look at an, a, a, a traditional uh, village or town at the same size, and look what they've got, really. So we commissioned some of them to go and look at a series of towns of that kind of size to check what mixed use they had. And of course, it was incredible. It was about what we've got on there. So real places defy planning policy. They even defy sales, which is difficult to believe. Uh, this is 21st century urban neighborhood to Grosvenor. It's slightly, I don't know why I'm talking about this, it's a bit confidential. I don't think they're going to follow through on it because of the political difficulty of achieving this in, in, in this particular place. But it's a kind of tragedy because it's potentially an amazing project. So this is Bermondsey, which is pretty much on the edge of central London. These are social housing blocks. Uh, this is an old biscuit factory. A lot of this is social housing. It looks dense, but it isn't. You know, what's the densest part of London, would you say, anyone? Kensington and Chelsea. What's the highest value bit of London? Kensington and Chelsea. Uh, which is a third the density of central Paris. Which is not shabby, is it? And so, we, we did all sorts of modeling. So, you know, Grover and Mayfair and Belgravia. So we just superimposed Mayfair on top of Bermondsey. And, and we weren't trying to encourage them to do Mayfair, except the urbanism is unbelievably good in Mayfair. And bear in mind it was a suburb when it was built. It wasn't the centre of the city, it was built on a marsh by Thomas Hugo and Cave. Um, and when you do that, you get something like eight times as many houses as are there. Uh, we did this complex kind of 
Because you make more money when you make it complex. <laughs> and we got a whole sort of matrix of themes and then worked out actions for each. But in the end, that was the sort of framework plan um, uh, across the, the whole piece. And Grover, of course, had the money to buy an entire urban neighborhood um, and form a public-private partnership with the local authority. And, and the advantage of doing it, and, and, and much less intense than that, is that you get three times as much housing. Uh, the people that live there now in the social housing can all be rehoused in better apartments, but you can house three times as many. Uh, you can improve the public realm. You can make it walkable and bikeable by changing the streets. And then everyone involved makes money. Now that's, you know, London, and you can't do it everywhere in quite the same way. But man, that's an impressive um, assembly of, of, of pieces. It shows the potential of sustainable neighborhood planning. I said that they, they probably won't do it, and that's because uh, Southwark, the local authorities, engaged in so many projects like this at the moment that the, 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 the political fractiousness that arises in rehousing is just too much for them. So it may be a few years yet before this kind of thing will, will come about. Um, I've got two minutes, and this was some of the architecture that was being a bit pompous, but that's correct. Right, right. um, I'm going to jump right, oh, this is, um, does anyone know where that is? That's uh, the main shopping street in Copenhagen in 1960. Um, and what's uplifting about this is that everyone assumes that the, 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 the most beautiful kind of sustainable cities, or bits of cities, were always like that. Kind of thing, but they're always like that. They weren't, and, and so the city architect back in 1960, and people like Jan Giel later on, Professor Jan Giel, who I'm sure is going to be over here and, and elsewhere, started to cook the idea that people were important in cities. And so you might think about redesigning the cities to be um, put people first rather than cars first, which was the big idea of the 60s and 70s. And look what happened. It's the same street. And look at the vivacity and the, the, you know, the social interaction. And again, think about money. If you were just thinking about it from an economic point of view, which is more successful? It's extraordinary. Right? The transformation in 30 years that's happened in that city. And, and it, these things are cumulative. You, start, you, you come up with the idea. You do a prototype. It kind of doesn't really work, but you learn from it. And you do it a bit better the next time. People start to use their bicycle walk. They see that they enjoy it and they're not dead. Um, and maybe their legs got half an inch longer from cycling every day. And then it just kind of, and it, then it becomes 38% of Germany's way back. Uh, 30 years later, I'm the most livable city in Europe. And look at it, you know. It's not that, that you can drive a car almost anywhere, but people don't. They choose to walk and cycle. And the quality of street life is just unbelievable. And you're playing terrible tennis in, in between two roads. It's, this, it's such a social thing to do, right? Now, uh, there's a whole thing now on... on uh, uh, one thing that we often neglect, I think, in, in urban design in, in, in our cities, whether we're thinking it's sustainable or not, is, is the rhythm of plots. We tend to do very monolithic plots and then have a big gap between them and then a, you know, and runs a commercial development, and now we've got a block of apartments, and then there's another commercial. Marathon High Street, I think for me, is probably, the, uh, I mean, it's again a very grand example, but... <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm bringing out the tools of you, I just Yeah, all right, but, I mean, look at the, look at the <laughs> plot rhythm, look at how interesting it is, therefore. And it's no surprise it's so busy, because it's so interesting. Whereas if that is one big glass front, uh, for 30 meters, which they often are, these like standardized brand shop units, and it's not nearly as interesting. But it doesn't have that fine grain. And this is knee harbor. Look at all the people there. That, was a, that photograph was taken about 20 minutes after one of the biggest downpours outside of an Indian monsoon had ever been. In. And it was chilly. And look at them all. And it's because it's such a beautiful street to be on. So the design of the streets and the blocks and the plots, this is old Amsterdam. That really is right. I'm going to wrap up and I'm going to talk about one of my own projects right at the end. So, excuse me a sec while we get there. And it's just about the economics of a big brownfield scheme that I want to come to now. 
That's the Cambridge one, the social architecture I was talking about. 3,000 meters square of PVDs on the roof. So this is our latest project, which is in Norwich coming up. Now, we're doing the joint venture agreement this week, so the timing is terrible. Um, sorry, forgive me a minute while we go there. They clearly have a few too many slides. <laughs> we, could have had, we could have made you more miserable over there. Uh, here we have it. So, if I can just have two minutes. Okay. So, this is, a, this is the biggest brownfield site in the East of England. Um, it's on the edge of a, 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 a city called Norwich. This is the edge of the city. Um, and this is the, the, the piece of land that um, we're acquiring in a joint venture with the landowner. And this, it already has outline planning. This was the, uh, I call it a planner's outline consent, because the developer would never build that. Uh, and it's barely viable. And they did it just to get kind of, with consultants, just to get kind of planning consent. Um, and it's such a terrible use of scarce brownfield land at the edge of the city. It doesn't even define the edge of the city very well. I won't explain the, the details of that. But it's got consent for about 700 units, limited by traffic impacts. Now, the centre of the city is just 1.4 kilometres away. You can walk it in 15 minutes. You could cycle it in seven, probably, on an existing cycle. We've, we've done that. That's our working master plan, which gives us 1,200 units. And it has 300 million uh, New Zealand dollars to the GDP and about 70 million dollars to the potential profit from doing it. So it's more sustainable, you're housing more people, you're able to leave half of the site for, whoops, for a nature reserve on the edge of there, putting a canal in to be the new edge of the city. So you've got townhouses facing across the canal onto the wetlands nature reserve. So you've got a beautiful condition. Uh, so, more profit, uh, more sustainable, uh, and better for people, arguably, in that kind of more intense urbanism. And I will stop there and sit down. I was going to say, Have both. You can't have both, but it does need a 
it does need the sorts of disciplines and skills that have been applied to these projects. Mark, you're in the execution space. What's your comment on that? Well, yeah, I'm at, at odds with, with almost every political view. I've spoken to all the major party leaders. Right. Um, we're involved with Treasury MB. There is, unfortunately, a very large old boys network that is at work in New Zealand politics that owns a lot of city fringe lands that likes making money. They're actually building houses. And that's, that's the root of the issue. Everyone involved in this debate at Auckland, the bureaucrats, the planning specialists, the developers know how to deliver city um, housing of the appropriate price point in locations that people want to live. It's just that we're not allowed to build them. And Hobsonville, all very well nice it is, and we're trying to help out there doing some interesting work. It's still a seaside suburb that's not like any other greenfield development with a billion dollar motorway running around it. The Fury Link it's not really a replica model for the city and it's it's frustrating to hell that we all know the solution and it's the political arm of both local and central government that is blocking the future of Auckland when there's so much good energy in the city that could be better. You'll note that all those are at where's the large scale redevelopment in Auckland sitting in the suburban environment? They talk of Tamaki, which has been about to happen for like 10 years, still nothing happening, what they're talking there is not of the vision with central government support to make it actually happen, there's still this myth of the private sector. And that's not now. Good to see we're not afraid to talk about it. Jonathan, do you have a comment on that, that you must have worked with um, significant decision makers, um, including those with a political um, agenda. What have you, your learnings been in terms of getting things done that need to be done that are on the side of angels and often it's difficult to see, though, see your way through to execution. I think, I mean, lots, I think, but I think the key is always that it's still singular leaders that make the good things happen. It's kind of weird, it shouldn't be, eh? but it's people like Roger Madeleine at Argent and the Groveners and the it's a few key companies that, that sort of set the standard. A lot of the policies are in place, but the execution is really, really poor, actually. And that's particularly true in uh, urban extensions and you know new house building. I think that the urban infill stuff is not super high quality, actually. In a place like London, the, the infrastructure is so resilient, actually, it can almost cope. What we forget is it's a sort of almost 19th, 18th century infrastructure. They had the foresight then to lay a city out and put its sewage infrastructure in place uh, and its underground system that is still resilient today. And without that, a lot of the stuff that's happening would be totally implausible. And a lot of the stuff that's happening isn't very good quality, actually. A lot of the new stuff that's happening in London isn't very high quality, and it's very elitist, uh, often. Um, but London can somehow cope because it's got, it's got a sort of resilience to it. So I don't know whether Auckland has that. I think that when you've got such astonishing natural setting that you've got here with your, with your waterfront and your views, I mean, this... this could be one of the great cities in the world, actually, and I know you, it may already be, for, I, don't, I don't know, but in terms of, it seems to punch below its weight a bit, I think. It does feel a bit carry. It does feel a bit diffuse in, in, in some respects, and, and it, it doesn't look like you're making best use of your waterfront and stuff. I, I'm actually a fan of Hobsonville. I, I went to see the site last time I was here, uh, and I think that there's a real role for for that kind of new settlement on those kinds of sites. I think they can do, I think there's a lifestyle that goes with it that a lot of people want. And I think providing the transport connections are good, and actually providing there's sometimes an economy there rather than just housing. Uh, I think they can take a lot of the pressure off them. Well, I think you need a hierarchy of settlements. But I think Auckland's, you know, one of the reasons I like coming in, I don't normally fly because, you know, for obvious reasons, I suppose, but um, is it just feels here that there's a chance you might just do it right. And that it's possible that you How could do it. How are you getting in if you don't fly? Pardon? How are you getting in if you're not flying? No, I said I don't normally fly. Oh, I see. Sorry. I, I don't mean to use it. I always fly to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, we, had a, we had a sustainable housing 
summit last week, um, the Green Building Council, and um, our keynote speaker was Andrea Reiner from the City of Vancouver. And one of the interesting things that she said was that um, in the 60s and 70s, that that the people from Los Angeles were going around testing the motorway model, and Vancouver was one of the only kind of cities that actually resisted it. And of course, they succeeded here, and so that is you know, partly why we are kind of quite so car centric. Um, and I took her to the mayor and said to mayor, and we were up on the top floor of that building, and she got to look out across Portland. And what was quite incredible was that she was looking down at Freeman's Bay going, oh my God, that's like right there, and it's single dwellings. That's just utterly incredible. You know, you just don't normally see that in our Western cities. Um, and one of the things that they have had in Vancouver is that they have actually been trying to stop people from going to live in the city centre. Because there are too many people in the city centre which is crowding out the work. Um, you know, it's been so successful that people actually want to live in the city centre in Vancouver. So that's kind of Fascinating, um, but they have similar kinds of affordability issues like we do. And one of the things that we thought about was, wouldn't it be really great if we could connect up Vancouver and Auckland and London and Vienna and Dublin, you know, where we have a lot of affordability issues around affordability, but some great models of, of housing in each place. Yes. genuinely listened, I think, uh, and, and they genuinely listened because they, they, they kind of, they worked out that we seemed a bit odd, which was kind of good because we're not the normal developer. Yeah, and, and I think probably the biggest learning for us is I think just thinking scale, and, and that's one of our challenges as a city, we just need to cope with scale. And we shouldn't be too hard on ourselves, we were, we were learning five years ago, there was nothing any great size that had been done in, in New Zealand and now the big, big projects, the Stonefields coming out of the ground, um, Long Bay, you know, and you can look at all of them and you can see what's good and bad about all of them, including our project. But the one thing that you have to do is you have to take the community with you genuinely. It's their community. We've got a, a design committee, and you hate that word, right? You see, see that, no, exactly. 
That's been going for 10 years, it still goes. They have been involved in every single major decision and have been brought along with the economics of the decision, the impact of the decision, and the multifaceted nature of the decision. Our industry, which I'm you know, Mark Corpa, is just so dreadfully disrespectful of people who they then expect to come and buy the houses off them. And we, we still are. And that once you change that view and say, we will actually respect their capital, because like everything starts with that person buying the apartment or the house, everything starts with that, then you change your view of how you plan to consult. The great companies will do it. Right? The, the, great, the great consumer companies will do it. They actually talk to their consumers. We build something. The bank will say, well, you've got to find half of them to actually pre-sell to, whoever they are, it doesn't matter, it's all sell to whoever. And then you'll get the rest of them later. Maybe they'll come. And then we sell them the compromise of what it was. You can't get away with that at scale because when, if you haven't done your first one and you got it right, then nothing else follows. <laughs> Second thing is that you actually have to front load your promises. You've got to have patient capital. And most of our industry at scale is poorly capitalised, very thinly capitalised. And the only solution for that is, I think, the sort of solution that's being talked about now, where you align the Crown and places like Panuku, who have got really key areas lined out for what they want to do in council. We're all learning how to do that well on the line. That's the patient capital. Mm -hmm. Then the developer's capital has to come up that because that's the best patient has got to make a return in turn. And we want to do that to keep building and building out. So to me, that are the key things. But part of that is the promise to the community. Yes, we're going to make some promises. We'll do these things. We will deliver them. And yes, they're the first out of the blocks. Then they trust you. Then it becomes back wins from there. In fact, that's when you actually start the escalating. Because the, the demand will grow from that. It almost becomes viral. So that was probably our, our greatest learning. Talk is cheap and no one believes it. And in particular with the government. <laughs> I think, sorry, I think Kate has got some really great examples around what you did. somebody's bathroom is a little bit different from somebody else's or the garage is different and so there's been heaps of challenges about delivering that but ultimately it's been a buy-in not only from the 30 families that we've got the houses for that we're handing keys over to but also the aunties and the uncles and the cousins and you know the, the whole community now feels like they have been engaged and part of it and there was a lot of mistrust of us at the outset of oh we've heard all this stuff before and you guys are not going to get here so we've had the you know, had the hecklers from the um, from the sites, but we're now delivering the product, and you know, there's a whole sense of community pride about what we're delivering as well. So I think that early engagement, and sure, our model's a little bit different in that at the moment we're only building for Barno, but we are getting underway with some of our work across um, on the Devonport Peninsula, and our first block Hillary, we're into um, resource consenting for, and we're trying to have a similar level of engagement with the local community there. So we're in public meetings and we're having discussion and we're making sure we're answering questions so people actually know what's coming because the worst thing is a vacuum and and a lack of information and that really just creates that whole atmosphere of oh my god what are they going to do how are they going to change it how is that going to impact me because the bottom line people want to know what the personal impact is going to be thanks we've got time for another question Thank you. with the developments down outside of london the infrastructure speaks actually to the previous question in that for us the, the most difficult thing is that people live in car dependent suburban settlements can't imagine a settlement that isn't car dependent so literally in the Basingstoke example there in, in the engagement over three years even the leader of the council says that you have to have in his view three cars per plot on plot which just means it's inimical to everything else that they also want. But they're blind to it because all they can, their entire experience of living in Basingstoke is 
if you don't have a car, you starve to death because you have to drive <coughs> four miles to a shop to buy some food. There are a lot of roundabouts. There are. There are. <laughs> and, you know, there was an issue in Norwich on the urban extension there where uh, the Greens asked us to speak out against the new ring road. Uh, and, you know, we, we were very dependent on the public authorities giving consent to our projects. And we, we didn't speak out against it, but we just set out our case for where the investment could could better go in terms of more direct connections through to the city centre, uh, proper cycle route and, and, and lanes. And uh, it seemed like a very common, we were summoned to the, the, the regional director of transport's office and he said to me, Jonathan, if you want planning consent for your scheme, you have to actively support this road. And we were like, well, I'm just not, I'm just not going to do it, you know. And that actually was fine in the end. So, so that was the sort of negative side. I think that the, um, I think a bit like Chris was suggesting, you, you have to kind of get on and build walkable neighbourhoods somehow by stealth, actually, because the, 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 the highways authorities are the most rigid, conservative outfits of the lot. In, in the other Norwich projects, it's easy because we're, we're almost in the city centre. So it's a question of making nice connections connecting a street to another street and then and then you can walk and cycle and, in terms of public transport and transport yeah. well, I mean you know obvious stuff like your higher space syntax Timstone as some of you will know to, to do a proper street network for you uh, based on what's worked all over the world um, you have a centre so it's easy for people to get there that's your transport node you build the highest intensity around that so and that connects through to the town or city centre really quickly. It's, it's a note, you know, that stuff's easy to understand what needs to be done. But in the real world, it's the sort of stealth and the getting, getting it in early that's, that's crucial. The word missing is not used enough in this whole sector of both public and private. It's a selective imagination. You have to lead people to imagine a different way of living. Like, to get on the other side, you have to make sure the developers can imagine a new way of delivery that makes just as much money that's more relevant it's more efficient, it's more sustainable, it's better use of land. And you've got to get the communities on board, which are often stubborn, even though they acknowledge their children can't live within a 15 kilometre radius of where they live, that the, that the new environment is possible, is economically feasible, and you've got to bring the politicians over here. The imagination is the big ingredient that you can see it just setting, just taking root in Auckland. Auckland's a rapidly changing city for the better, but everyone collectively just needs to imagine a different way of doing things. Imagine a more remarkable life. Um, we have uh, one last question, I think. Yeah. Um, um, I was just interested in your views more collectively on this question comes up a lot, but around uh, urban redevelopment and how we'll deal with uh, multiple fragmented parcels of land and developing at scale and whether that's something that is best done led to the market or is best done by a, a development agency. So, having, having sat and listened to Mr. To Minister Smith today, he's going to solve it for you by having UDAs and he'll go and acquire it all and then make it available to the market. And um, you know, I'm being a little bit um, flippant about that, but I suspect, my view anyway, is that uh, singular ownership gets over an awful lot of problems. You, know, you can deliver, you can control your boundaries, you are minimising your neighbours and your um, consenting issues and so that, that um, amalgamation of ownership and being to, being to split it out subsequently, I think Chris will agree on that, is, is it certainly one way to control your outcomes? Well, if you're talking about urban regeneration or suburban regeneration, I, I think it's a mis complete misnomer that you need to unify plots if you've got the right planning regime. We've done exemplar developments on a thousand square metres. Yeah. You can get three times the density and 50% more green space. Right. And in fact, you don't want to have forced um, conglomeration of titles or unification of titles across the suburban street because then you get a large development and it into a, a sensitive a neighbourhood and you could have a collection of smaller ones with infinite variety. So it depends on the context. But in principle, in the suburban setting, I think it's actually harmful rather than protecting. It's easy for the developer, of course, but it's actually harmful for the community because anything that does happen with large scale, it affects the community rather. 
specifically over 10 or 20 years, suddenly you've got 100 new units in the street, which you might not want them, but they would accept 10 lots of five over you know, 15 years. So. And you can do that. Well, that seems to me a lot. One of those questions where it's a this a bit of that, and that one just set up to on the fence. We, the cold, hard dose reality of our is we're growing faster than anybody ever imagined we'll be growing before. And we will be a brown city if we're not a green city. And if we're a brown city, we actually won't be attractive and we'll die as a city. And that's what's happening globally. So that particularly with the millennials, there's huge changes going on with technology. Solving this problem is one of them. One, about five to seven, I think it's seven or eight percent of every house in Auckland, for instance, is a housing New Zealand house. That's one of our realities of our social welfare system that we've grown up with. Most of those now are no longer fit for purpose at all. They're on very big plots of land. There's about a four to one ratio of where they should actually be to be half efficient, even more than that if you want to fit the, fit the model of the entry plan. That is a, that's an elephant in the room. That needs to be resolved. The social issues around that. So you're talking about tens of thousands of homes, I think it's about 40,000 homes that need to be replaced. We've also got um, we've also a, a significant shortage of smaller homes and homes for baby boomers, which are also smaller. They're our two big dumbbells. Yeah. So, so there's a sort of a, a luxury of having a view and then to say, well, what is the cold hard dose reality? Without wanting someone else to support my minister, although he would talk to my so I did. Um, <laughs> want to support him. I, I've watched what the Australians have done, and they have they've, they've used a mixture of all of these tools in the toolkit. They do have the tool they do have the tool which is compulsory acquisition, but it has to be well proven, and it has to be demonstrated that what you because Mark's view is something can adequately be achieved. In fact, you can do it on greenfields. I mean, Mark goes and buys land. We don't we don't do, buy, buys the plot. He'll express himself entirely on that, and we'll work within the context of things. It won't try to be too to allow for that freedom, and that's the greenfield. So it can definitely happen in brownfields. But so, so to me, it's the toolbox approach. And then the, the last aspect of that is that um, Auckland City has one of the lowest aggregations of land in the hands of the government or local government than almost any other city in the OECD. And most of our land is held out in this state, in the conservation state. You can't shape cities without owning land. That's a cold dose of reality. Nobody privately will build a park for the public on their front lawn. Well, sorry, a few very philanthropic people may do. So you actually do need to get the land, you do need to get it together, and we need to do that quite fast. So it's a bit of a bit of bob each way on those in that answer I said as a toolbox approach. And we need all tools in the toolkit if we need them now. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are um Finishing now, we have run out of time unfortunately. I'm sure you'll agree it was a fascinating discussion. Um, and if you join me to thank our panellists, Kate, Alex, Chris, Mark, and of course Jonathan for joining us tonight. It was really interesting. Thank you. Thank you.